I worry immensely about education and skills development in India, which no government seems to be tackling. And I don't understand why. It is the heart and soul of the fabric of a country. And yet, we aren't doing enough about it. 9-11 hit us in the middle of the Gen Pact rise. I thought our industry had ended. I thought business is over. What it teaches you is no crisis is as bad as it seems. And no good times are as good as this. What are you bullish on? I'm very bullish on India economically. I think we'll grow well, hmm. but I'm not sure that it will happen at the scale and speed which we need it to happen to lift the country out of poverty. I didn't know the Indian market when I came to India, but you knew how to hire people, put them together, make them work as a team, build a culture, do all of those things. And that's where GenPact was born. Greetings everyone. Today we are at home of a very special guest. He's the pioneer of Indian business process management industry. He's the founder of GenPack, which is a New York Stock Exchange listed company which hires more than 1 lakh people. He's also the founder of Clix Capital, Asha Impact, and also serves on the board of Ashoka and Plaksha University. He's an art lover. His energy matches to a 22-year-old, Mr. Pramod Basan. Thanks a ton, a million times for doing this, sir. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. So, I have a very distinct memory of GenPack from my childhood. So, I hail from Jaipur. Or my father used to take me to ice cream nights. And when you used to cross the <coughs> GLN road, mm. and I, to, I used to see the big office of Genpack, and I, I always wondered what happens inside this building because during that time, that was the only building, only big building. Absolutely. Uh, apart from MNIT and Fortis Ab Hospital. Absolutely. Uh, and here we are today <coughs> to dissect what you do at Genpack, sir. <laughs> so, coming to your early days, what were you dreaming when you were 22 years old? How was it back then? I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you in many of these questions. I wasn't dreaming of anything at all. <laughs> I was not ambitious. I was far more interested in sports. Hmm. Um, I was wandering around London and enjoying myself thoroughly with all the soci social um, things that you could do there. Um, didn't have much money. Hmm. Uh, didn't have any money. Um, so I don't think I was so channeled as kids are today uh, into this is what I want to do and that is what I want to do. My aim was I was far more interested in experiencing the world than I was in actually building a career at that time because at that time I thought career building can take place later. So I'm afraid I was not a role model of any kind to anyone <laughs> in terms of what I was doing at 22. <laughs> so do you remember your first day at G Capital, sir? Um, I joined, um, actually I was doing chartered accountancy huh. in those days. So we were at work anyway. Okay. So it wasn't like it was a working, hmm. uh, it was new to working because in articles, especially in London, you huh. work a full day okay. and you do your exams in between, etc. So we had done that, but actually I became part of GE hmm. because they bought RCA when I had moved to the U.S., and I had joined RCA back in 79, I think it was. <clears throat> I'd qualified, I'd done my charter accountancy in London. I'd gone to Bahrain for a couple of years. I've come back, joined RCA at that time in a place called Sunbury in huh. the UK, tiny town. Um, but a very interesting company. You know, They owned Hertz Rent-A-Car. They owned RCA Records. Hmm. They owned many major brands. They owned the... TV appliance brands in America, right. uh, solid state company, manufacturing company. They owned NBC. Hmm. So it was a very interesting company um, and conglomerate, which then got swallowed by GE. And that's how I ended up in the GE audit staff and then GE Capital from there. So basically, you had a job of leverage buyouts. So what did you learn from during those days which helped you build GenPact? Yeah. What were the learnings from leverage buyout? And for people who don't know leverage buyout, can you break that down? <laughs> yes. You know, these were the days of um, junk bonds, Mike Milken, barbarians huh. at the gate, huh. you know, greed is good, all of that. So it was very heady days. And we were <laughs> at G Capital. I was the CFO of the leverage buyout huh. business and then um, part of the portfolio restructuring group. And what we were in charge of is leverage buyouts is basically leveraging 
debt onto a company okay. to buy it out hmm. and then spinning it off a few years later, five years later, seven years later um, to make a profit by letting the company expand, giving it capital, putting management in, whatever it may be. Uh, we ended up as owners of all kinds of companies, okay. shoe stores, hmm. dress stores, Woolworth-like stores, um, beer distributors, hmm. um, news channels, etc. The length and breadth we we own, and we had to manage the debt huh. on those companies. Um, it was the most extraordinary learning of our lives because you were having to buy companies, sell companies, negotiate deals, hmm. do things which we had never done before with very street smart, very sharp Wall Street people. Hmm. So actually there's nothing like it in the world, anywhere else in the world, other than I think in Wall Street uh, and those days because it was cut and thrust. It was pretty, it was rough. It was pretty brutal because it was high stakes, you know. And those days we were managing a portfolio. I remember my portfolio was about two and a half billion dollars, which in today's world is probably equivalent to a hundred billion. Um, and we were actually operating these companies. So I remember a company called Shoe Town, where we would have to appoint the CEO, try and hmm. sell assets, buy assets, decide what to do, all things which we had never learned before. It do two or three things which to me epitomize America also. Hmm. Um, and I'm not a fan of America politically, but okay. I'm a fan of America's model, huh. which, is, which is fantastic. Um, no fear of failure. You had guts, you, hmm. had, you really had to have amazing guts to get into the market, hmm. go and negotiate a deal to buy and sell a company. I, you're, you're a very young guy and you are trying to sell companies and buy companies and manage companies. So no fear of failure, you're bored, you go in there, you do it first. Two, the caliber of people huh. on the other side, um, very sharp, lawyers, bankers, hmm. junk bond holders, company executives, et cetera, the best of the best. So working with them really honed your commercial instincts, your negotiating instincts, et cetera. But mostly it was around, within GE Capital and GE, it was the notion of leadership that we learned from our bosses, Jack Welch, right. who we worked closely with, and Gary Went. Uh, these were, you know, GE was the most admired company in the world at that time for many 10 years for management and leadership. Right. Other companies today are admired for technology, Microsoft, right. etc. GE was admired because it was a conglomerate for its management capability. And I think that was the greatest learning I could have ever had, um, which led me to building things like GenPact. So you mentioned that Americans don't have any fear of failure. Absolutely. What does it take for an individual or for a country to imbibe this fear of no, you know, no fear of failure. How do you do that? <laughs> I think it's a perfect question. As I mentioned, I do as you mentioned, I do teach leadership at Ashoka. from time to time at Ashoka. One of the things I take to talk to people about is risk taking. Hmm. I really do think it's changing, but Indians don't take risks very easily. Hmm. We're culturally very. Uh, Safeguarded. Safeguarded. Beta, sambal ke rao, hmm. you know, don't take too much risks. Job safety. Job safety. Ah. You know, when I was spinning off from GE Capital to buy GenPack, my mother called me up and said, what is the matter with you, son? Why would you leave GE Capital? Why ah. would you do this? Hmm. And there's no way I could explain to her that this was a significant opportunity to create something new. But her instinct was very much of, she actually thought I, was, I had been fired by G Capital, which is why I had been forced <laughs> <laughs> to go and start this new venture. Otherwise, who, which person in their sanity would leave a company like G, right? So we are, and I think it's cultural, it's hierarchical, it's all of that. Hmm. The, what does happen in the US, and it has a double-edged sword, okay. is as a young kid, you compete you are seeing people achieve so much around you. It fires you up. Hmm. And, it, and organizational cultures are such 
that they break barriers. You know, a colleague of mine was a chap called Mike Frazier at 30 <laughs> years. He'd done some great work. The audit staff in GE was like a consulting arm, internal consulting arm, not really audit stuff, but internal consulting, very strong. Huh. Half the CEOs of GE came from the audit staff. Um, you know, at 30, he made a presentation to Welch. He loved him. 30, he made him president of GE Japan. He's in Jisco. Oh. Right, so you take people like that, you give them extraordinary um, positions. You tell, you set examples around you of, you can do anything. It doesn't matter how old you are. I think breaking through that is very important in India. That hierarchy of age, experience, etc. I keep telling people the only thing experience gives you is a really bad memory. Other than that, it doesn't help you very much. And you must carve your own path. And since people there are doing it, you think, think about Zuckerberg. Think about these guys. How did they learn to build the biggest companies in the world at from the age of 23, 25? How did they learn? And how did they have the guts to go out and do it? Now we're seeing more in right. India. Right. But we still, for instance, don't see global companies here uh, as very, there are none. Hmm. Um, so I think culturally that view of the world that we can huh. achieve anything, we can take on the world, uh, you don't have to take it on either, by the way. You just have to learn where the opportunities are and work with them. It doesn't always have to be a clash. Hmm. Um, I think that is the best lesson I ever heard where we were uh, with under GE Capital, we would acquire a large number of companies every year, uh, every year. And I remember my boss coming to India, GE Capital, Gary hmm. went. Hmm. The first time he met HDFC and Deepak Parekh, I mean, the ah. next day he said, can we buy you? All right. Huh. So it's just like, it's like that. It's not, you're not awed by it. You are respectful, mm -hmm. but not awed. You are thoughtful and insightful, but you're not scared. And if you fail, you've at least tried, but you don't not try as well. That fear of failure, I hope we can drill out of all our students, wherever they may be. And again, and I would say rebellion is hmm. very important. I was a rebellious. Type. I was rebellious. Tell us not as a child. Okay. Not okay. as a child. But subsequently, when I hit the US, huh. I was very rebellious against my bosses, against the way of work. Jetpack was built as a skunk work. Hmm. Welch never wanted headcount. We didn't tell him. Wow. I did it, I built it with Gary Wen. I go into him and I said, Gary, and Gary and Jack, Gary was head of G Capital, Jack was head of GE, they never got along. Hmm. Gary was huh. the guy who brought me here. Jack put me here also, of course, he would have had to approve it. But I went to Gary and said, Gary gave me $2 million, I have this idea, I want hmm. to try it. And he gave me $2 million. We didn't tell anybody. We just got on with it. And then once it started succeeding, the news got out. And in fact, Welch came by huh. to say, you know, let me, let me understand, what is this thing that you've built? <laughs> and, and another boss of mine came in from GE. Mm -hmm. um, and his first words of me, my immediate boss was, what is this monster you've built, Primo? Um, and therefore, I just said, I'm going to build it. Mm -hmm. Whether I build it with you or I build it elsewhere, this is happening. So yes, I, that the art of rebellion questioning the status quo, um, pushing against what are the norms, pushing against hierarchy, pushing against somebody saying, I've been doing this for 25 years. By the way, I do that a lot, which I've got to stop, but I've been doing this for 25 years, so I know. And pushing against that and saying, what you know is irrelevant, you know. That's why they say conventional wisdom kills creativity, imagination. Kills creativity. Accountants, I'm an accountant. They kill creativity, innovation. <laughs> Well, mm. most of the time because they want measurements on things that happen. Genpak, they asked me, you know, give me a business plan. One of, when I first thought about it, my yeah. business, I handed him literally, and this is where I was rebellious, my boss is sitting, I handed him a blank sheet of paper. And I said, tell me what you want on it. Profit, loss, breaking, what would you like? I'll do the maths. I'll, I, said, I'll show that. I said, I'll put numbers down. The only thing I'll promise you, they will all be wrong. But this is a new idea. What do you want me to do? So I think that, that boldness and breeding was all America. It's brash. Hmm. Sometimes it's ugly. 
um, but it drives change and it drives the quest <clears throat> for new opportunities. But talk about your relationship with your bosses. Uh, but tell us, is it true that the idea came to you um, while during during a walk in the parking lot? And what was the insight? Because you know, greatest businesses are built on deepest consumer insight. Uh, yes. What was the insight behind GE Capital? Do you remember the time when yeah, you yeah, had the absolutely? I, we had built this processing facility in Chennai for GE Capital India. Okay. At that time, when you gave a loan, you collected 36 post-dated checks from the customer. Right. Okay. So if you give them an auto loan for three years, you collect 36 post-dated checks. Right. We created this facility where these checks had to be filed. Okay. Okay. And banked every month. Now, if you have 10,000 customers, How do you 36 post-dated checks, do the math as to where you, how many checks you're managing. So we had set up this operating center huh. and my boss was there uh, and G Capital itself wasn't making enough money in India. India was a small market in those days. Uh, we were ahead of the curve hmm. by a long ways. And that's when I thought, I was just standing there and I thought, then I asked him and, and this was one of the joys of running a, of hmm. building a business with a great culture is that everybody in that business was entrepreneurial. Everybody in G. Even at the top level, they were complete entrepreneurs. They were willing to try anything new. You gave to them with a good idea, they would say, go. They'll back it up. They would go, right? And if you didn't come to them with a good idea, they would actually push you and say, you know, that was yesterday's ideas. What's today? Tell us something new. So it was fantastic. And I went to him and that's where it came from. I said, look, Nigel, we're doing this for ourselves in India. I can do this for the rest of the world. Um, and he immediately said, go for it. And he said, it's a good idea, Pramod. Why don't you think about it, flesh it out, let me know how it'll work. And boom, that's how, that's how it's done. We had no idea how to do it. Look, hmm. I'd done leverage buyouts. I knew nothing about telecom lines, E1, hmm. T1s, process, business process. Outs. I didn't even know what the word meant. I didn't even know what uh, the nomenclature within the industry meant. I had no clue. Then how did it happen? Uh, you know, again, it's the management lesson 101 from GE. You hire fan, fan, uh, terrific people. You hire experts. You hire other people. Again, this is my learning back from hmm. the leverage buyout days, right? When you're running a shoe store. I, mean, I was huh. running a lady's shoe store, for God's sake. Uh, where, uh, what do you learn? Where do you learn? You better. The first thing you learn is you better get some help. <laughs> and you better get some credible people. So that's why I went out and... Hmm. Fortunately, I had a very wonderful HR guy called Raghu Krishnamurthy, who's now the head of HR for GE hmm. uh, globally. Uh, he became the head of HR. And I went to him and said, Raghu, look, what do we do with this idea? Huh. And he said, look, I'll tell you. Amex is doing this. There's a guy there called Raman Roy. Huh. Let me call him. Um, you should meet him. He is doing some of this, so he will know how to do this. Okay. And I went and met Raman. And um, I remember meeting him at the Belvedere Hotel, uh, Belvedere uh, in the Oberoi. It's a mm. business club. Um, sat there. And he also asked me, he says, so Prabhupada, what's the plan? I did the same thing to him. I gave him a blank sheet of paper. I said, this is the plan. <laughs> I, I said, I have no plan. <laughs> and that's how we learn. It was the diversity of management bandwidth, the expertise in leadership, in building leadership teams, uh, really understanding how to empower them, how to make them strong, how to hire the best people in the world. G Capital itself had a phenomenal, mm -hmm. really phenomenal uh, management team. If you look at all those people now, you're going to see them running mm -hmm. things like Bajaj Capital, etc. I mean, a lot of those people wow. are all G Capital people, right, who came up. So phenomenal legacy of exceptional talent is what we had collected because that's what I had learned. The best. I didn't know the Indian market when I came to uh, came to India, but you knew how to hire people, put them together, make them work as a team, build a culture, do all of those things, and that's where GenPact was born. And Raman came in, then we hired some other people. He brought some other people in. He taught me what, um, you know, um, and he's again kudos to him. He's the one who came to me and said, we were doing back-end accounting, huh. transaction processing. He's the one who came to me and said, Pramod, we can do call centers. Hmm. And I said, bullshit. We can't do call centers. It'll never happen. He said, I'll show you. And he went, got the telecom license through STPI, etc. I mean, these are path-breaking things. We take Gurgaon for granted. But yes, so they say that you're the man behind 
the birth of gurgaon <laughs> what was the story behind it sir there is no i'm not the man behind the birth of gurgaon um but yes we led the revolution of gurgaon for sure um we take this for granted so easily hmm. 25 years ago gurgaon didn't exist it's only 25 years hmm. everybody i remember looking out of my office there were sheep all over the road with shepherds herding them to the farmlands ab ja ke everybody thinks highway banao ye karo wo karo thank you in those days there was no transport no lunch no way to get employees back and forth no office buildings the only offices were corp dele corporate park which we had taken the back and we started there on the fourth floor uh, we jammed people in and started this whole um, operation then pilot and gurgaon burst from there so then we went on to the highway because our first operating centers our first call centers were set up on the highway in warehouses there was no other hmm. office building none um there were some old buildings around you could take them but you had to convert them you had to polish them up you had to um put all the basic basic stuff there was no transportation how do you get employees back and forth there was no employees who knew how to do the work we wanted them to do so how do you set up training centers how do you set up where do you get the trainers from so if you're going to do mortgage processing well it doesn't exist in india there are no people who know it there are no trainers you can find who can teach them um the telecom doesn't exist the platforms don't exist the product doesn't exist how do you do this how do you do this no fear of failure you dive you break it down into its segments mm. you know you need a trainer we got trainers from the us we got trainers from ge we got trainers from europe you need somebody who are mortgage specialists you hire people locally mm. you train them up you send them overseas you get them trained you hire employees you figure out how to get the employees into place you figure out how to train them you figure out how to um, make sure that their performance mm. is very good you put operating standards in place you learn from those from other industries you learn it from ge you bring those into place uh you <clears throat> have to learn how to feed people get infrastructure all of that done transportation get them you put all the pieces of the puzzle together one by one one by one you just sit through it and go through it like and you bring in you bring in the key was you you bring in the best leadership talent that you can you hire fantastic we come to this leadership talent but while you're saying you were you know putting the pieces together yes. you're also you know haggling with the government so because of getting the telecom licenses getting you know all all the, all those things to set up uh, the the beautiful thing that you did but how did you work with government because we have heard the stories of red tapeism and yes. you have you have worked with the government at every stage in your life sure. after coming to india sure tell us how was it how did you figure it out your way <laughs> in this case the industry is thrive because we didn't have to work with the government that much okay except for the stpi license <laughs> which raman roy is the architect he figured it out because the telecom department was never going to give us a license to connect by satellite dish of our own with the world outside why so because it's against the law because the telecom companies in those days there was no mobile phones hmm. um there was no internet nothing um well the internet was there sorry it had just about happened hmm. uh but it was against telecom laws to allow private people to play hmm. it was still a government monopoly or given to people who had a license if you didn't have a license so we went to stpi and they gave us a license for this and said hmm. all right under our licensing we'll allow you to put up that satellite dish and go we had to do that Hmm. after that fortunately because of the nature of our business we actually didn't have a lot of uh red tape tapeism to deal with because we had people we were training people having them sit on on computers and work on a computer so you know there was not much of um intervention that was required i'll be honest with you i don't think the world realized what we were doing most of the world did um indian government did most people would come and look at us and then the word started getting around and everybody started saying to me hmm. what are you doing can we come and see it and even when we brought them in they still didn't get it as to what was going on that it was a revolution 
uh, happening in front of them. And, they, and this was revolutionary because suddenly what happened is that the world, the, your opportunity opened up and you said, you reversed the thing. Earlier you were saying, what can you do out of India? Hmm. Now you were saying, what can't you do out of India? And it pretty much spread, right? Finance, accounting, analysis, underwriting, software, technology, e-learning, uh, mortgages, pharmaceutical companies, sales forces, all of it you could do from here. Hmm. And that just exploded in front of us. We had a huge tiger by the tail and it was, it was gallivanting at a pace which every day was a new incident. Every day was a new problem. Every day was a problem solving board which built the culture of Jetpack. So the culture of Jetpack is unique because we fought all this fought through all this. And so as a team, hmm. we would wake up every morning and say, okay, now what? What's going on? Contract hasn't tried, building isn't ready, telecom has fallen off, the bus hasn't tried, people aren't trained, chairs are not in position, because there were no vendors. I mean, we were looking for hmm. vendors to say, for instance, some very simple thing. We were saying, we need to feed breakfast, lunch, and dinner to a thousand people. Nobody. There's no one in India who could do that at all. So then you have to build a vendor. Then you have to get, you know, it must have been like what Maruti did with auto manufacturing when it first started. You start building those services, building those. I remember we went off and got the uh, guys who do Indian Railways catering. Hmm. We brought them in because we wow. said they can handle volume. <laughs> Nobody else could handle volume. <laughs> so it was things like that that you were fighting and it built the culture and the spirit of the company. We really felt that we could. So it, the world. It, it was revolutionary because people thought that India is nothing. Then you basically educated the talent and they were outsourcing all the business processes work like financial accounting, um, call centers and it, everything. It was revolutionary because the concept of getting all your work done overseas didn't exist. Okay. And at a very, at a very good cost advantage. Not just that, but you're doing mission critical work. Okay. Right. You're closing the books of accounts. Hmm. You're doing financial analysis. You're doing investment banking. Analysis. The concept of getting all your work done by someone else 10,000 miles away just didn't exist. And that is the revolutionary part where suddenly you realize all the work you're doing in the US, in Europe, can actually be done in India. out of India. And then we took that concept to China. So I started the whole operation in Dalian, hmm. which is China's kind of Bangalore, uh, where they have the summer Davos, et cetera. China, accidents of history, uh, has a lot of Japanese speaking Chinese in Manchuria, in hmm. Dalian. And we started serving Japanese clients from there. Wow. We started doing that in Budapest, in Bucharest. Hmm. We did that in Guatemala, Juarez. Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, South Africa. We started just going across the world. In every case, this was a new event. I remember going to China in Dalian, and hmm. there's no, they never, I don't think they'd met an Indian before, you know, this funny Indian guy wandering around and, you know. But the, bless the Chinese, he got it in a minute. And he didn't really want to know what I did. He was just saying, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna create employment? I said, yes. Computers, technology, yes. Are we going to be able to do this and bring an industry around us? Absolutely. And from that, Dalian has grown. Everybody's there. Accenture, all the Indian companies, everybody's moved to Dalian since then. Same thing happened in Gurgaon. When we talk about, you know, being the architect of Gurgaon, not the architect, but, you know, we worked with DLF very closely. But every other company started for, every other company would come and look at us and say, what are you doing? Hmm. And we tell them, uh, yeah, have a peek. <laughs> and, but the, the, and they would ask us if we would do it for them. Hmm. And again, big companies often miss opportunities. GE would let me do it for them. I could have done this for everyone. Accenture came to us. Bank of America came to us. Standard Chart. Every company which made our operation said, we'll come to you. We'll do this for us. And we said, no. Wow. And that's when all of them showed up in Gurugan, all around us. You know, um, the hotel started. You have to think of extraordinary things. You have to think about how cities are built. You have to think about where accommodation comes from. You have to think about where people will live, 
where will they be entertained? At that time, the only place we could go to for our evening events were the Bristol Hotel. I remember that's it <laughs> in Gurgaon. Which... What were some learnings while you were seeing the city, you know, thriving? You fig- did you have some insights about you know? The, okay, we we are setting up a city. The city should look like this twenty five years down the lane. What, no. what were some insights? How how was it shaping? No, we 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 didn't have, we weren't part of that. Uh, we left that to DLF, the builders and the other people, and hmm. Gurgaon. That was a hill too far for me to climb because what we were doing was just thinking about um, how do we work with our employees and the onslaught that had started happening of other companies coming there and the mayhem created by thousands of people showing up in a essentially a village at that point in time right that's all it was uh, it's like a village and thousands of employees every morning we were shipping everybody in back and forth every morning so the learnings were extraordinary um and at the broadest highest level the most exciting part of the journey was just the talent we had in india and fulfilling the hopes and aspirations of thousands of young people whose families whose lives were changed by the work we were doing because remember unlike many other huh. professions we were employing basic graduates too their other jobs would have been god knows what here suddenly they were coming in we were training them sending them overseas bring them back allowing them to earn more money their lives were changing their family lives were changing uh, the profound impact to me was not about the city than it was about impacting the lives of i don't know 100000 families around the country and um, bringing them into the fold that was extraordinary so let's break this down you are mentioning about you know they say ki india is going to reap a great demographic dividend yes. because of the young population Absolutely. that we have absolutely and the thing is that undirected youth is a very bad thing to have and you went on to basically educate you know cultivate the talent among indians uh, about the things that they have never done before we have youth but the problem with that youth is most of them are undirected you know we have huge population Uh, unemployment is through the rise how do you go about training and upskilling this youth and this 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 Changing the large yeah. In, yeah. in in a large way the india's tragedy today apart from you know many other things it is doing is that it has not revamped its education and skilling system Hmm. and as a result companies like us in genpact and the it companies out there basically set up our own universities internally after graduating from the college you have to go through a training program in your massive one but it, it, this is only because the universities are not doing their job right you are completely you're coming out with very little knowledge of a basic subject hmm. of english itself of how to go to work how to build a career how to think about life in a after after college uh, none of those directions are available to them and our education system for the broad mass is woefully inadequate skilling doesn't really exist i did the skills academy for many years complete failure um it doesn't exist because we are trying to overtake 12 months of bad schools with 8 weeks of training it's not going to happen 12 years of bad schooling bad schooling hmm. right all these kids coming through school they know nothing when you sit with them and you ask them what do you know do you know a subject matter do you know this do you know that nothing so even if you think about this in all its aspects of um performance and standards and um adherence to excellence adherence to quality Hmm. I'm afraid even from the best some of the finest colleges and schools in India they it's not existent they just don't have that sense of discipline that sense of it's not discipline in terms of do hmm. this sense of self discipline 
mm. of working in a certain style, working with minimum methodologies, working up to a minimum standards, um, making sure that things are done with exceptional care. Um, you know, these things become absolutely critical and important as you go forward. But we don't teach them. Where's the problem? What's the root? Education system, schools, the way the schools are run. I mean, the caliber of the school, caliber of the teachers, the caliber of the schools themselves, the state of the schools, the work in, that's happening in the schools. These are areas which desperately need a remap. And I keep talking about this publicly a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just spoken about it at conferences, et cetera, also. No country in the world has gone beyond a certain point without essentially revamping its education. So China did this 30 years ago. That is where it is. We can talk about China in many different fashions, but the fact is it revamped its system 30 years ago, the education system, and that's why they are where they are. And they say it's 10 years ahead in AI and ML than the states. 100%. 100%. Not just 10 years. I think it's <laughs> further than that. It's way ahead in financial services than anyone else in the world. You know, our digital public infrastructure today mm. is fabulous. Sure. China did build that 20 years ago. We built ours, which is unique, but you know, WePay has been around since 2007. And um, so there's extraordinary movement, but it, it's born of the heart of education. I love being part of Plaksha. I love being part of Ashoka. I'm a founder in both these places. How many students will we train? 5,000. We need to train 500,000. How do you do that? We have to build new models, in my view. I think we have to, for instance, and I have this discussion with RP from time to time at Plaksha, um, that if we built a model of excellence, we now have to take that model of excellence and make it work for five times the population and stay good and stay excellent. Do not dilute it. And it's up to us to find a way to do it. See, one of the things about the, 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 the problem with fear of no fear of failure is that you do stupid things. <laughs> so I come up with these stupid ideas, which I'm saying, I defy conventional wisdom, which is colleges are meant for 20 students in a class, 30 students. Harvard has 200 people in a class. Everybody says, no, it must be on the campus. It must be done this way. We can train 2,000 people. No, 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 no. Go and find a way to train 20,000 students through the same platform. Hmm. And so unless we do that, India's demographic dividends will not happen because that sense of, if you want to build a great product, engineering product, whatever product it may be, you need the entire chain to work really hmm. well. You need the entire chain to work really well. If you look at the basic bulwarks hmm. of society in India, <clears throat> none of the chains work. There's a breakdown at every point, which is expensive, unproductive, takes up too much time, et cetera. You can't have that. Those have to go away. So that when you say, I need this done by, I need this product made in such and such time, that product is made to perfection in such and such time, delivered, brought to you, et cetera. For that to happen, there's an entire supply chain that needs to be in place, mm -hmm. delivering the same level of excellence. It happened at Genpack. We had to train people to deliver excellence in processes for global companies. Right. They weren't really that interested in 95% quality. They wanted 99%. True. Our employees were not that used to having to deliver that high level of quality day in, day out. This is a good problem statement. How did you solve that? Ex many different ways. Um, the, but the core and the base was training. And training rigorously, thoughtfully, with understanding about what it is that needed to hmm. be done, how they were going to do it, running pilots, but then creating on top of that standards and operating methods. That's when we imbibed Six Sigma. Hmm. We brought Six Sigma in wholeheartedly as kind of the way we ran our business, the kind of the way we ran our measurements of quality, our adherence to that quality standard, so that we were very clear that our quality we would deliver would be better than what they would get themselves. 
because you know as hmm. a very wise ceo of honeywell said it to me he said and he was an xg guy he knew me um and he said promote your quality has to be superb because you know honestly hmm. if in in america something goes wrong it will be a problem of the accounts payable clerk in india something goes wrong it will become an india problem everybody is going to say see you do this in india this is what happens and you were the pioneer if you did the harm to the reputation is gone it was gone right so if you screwed up badly it was over right so you had to deliver at his excellence in quality and ge was known for that by the way so ge was the best teacher we could find for our people very empathetic very good but no no compromise and i think that lack of uh, compromise in our work every day is something i think uh, india still has to learn that when we say don't share a password we mean don't share a password we don't mean okay share a password a little bit <laughs> you <Got know>? it. <laughs> so why did you decide to uh, list your company in new york and not in india and if you were to do that again at this point would you still go for this listing in states yes yes always why always. well one our shareholders were all american right okay they were all american two that's a much deeper market the market hmm. itself is deeper. of course the indian market is now deeper and if you want global shareholders and global customers and you want um you know a lot of it is to do with credibility with the customers although of course infosys tcs who are much bigger than us um all have that anyway so it's not a big issue but for us it was important to get that credibility in the early. we were very we were real pioneers so a lot hmm. of the things that it could do um we couldn't do because we had to prove ourselves all the time so yeah, unlike it huh. where in those days you were doing a lot of things at the back office which didn't impact your customer in the front office immediately we were live if you made a mistake in something at a month end you had the potential to hold up the closing of the books for a public limited company i mean it was untenable it was not you can't do that so you had to build credibility you had to build trust and one of the things we thought was being in new york stock exchange would give us credibility and trust when we walked into a new client and said and they said who are you and we would say hey we're a new york stock exchange company wow and you, you you mentioned that six sigma helped you uh, do this so there are people students at plaksha who don't know what is six sigma is can you can you break that down sir <laughs> well six sigma basically stands for the fact that uh, a six sigma is a standard of how hmm. many errors you may have or standard of excellence right. it basically means that you will have six errors per a million opportunities okay so it's extraordinarily um difficult to reach actually you don't hmm. most people don't ever 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 reach six sigma a few products do by the way aircraft engine like the toyota and the japanese cars that's really where it came from huh. uh, and the lean came from there uh, i would imagine toyota is still not at six sigma i imagine they are five, five. or four huh. Uh, aircraft engine are at seven sigma. Wow! So aircraft engine haven't broke. There's not a single failure that has happened in aircraft engine to cause an air crash in the last fifty years. Okay. Tell us some insights. When you were going, I just want I want to double click on this. When you were training these people at a large scale. Yes. Tell us some insights that you had while creating that training model. So you mentioned that. you know you were bringing the best people from ge to teach yes. the folks yes. what were other things what were some other insights that help you train these people up to a level where you can you know they can be trusted with <laughs> <laughs> um you know the the it started i'm afraid with a recognition that what they had been taught hmm. earlier really almost had to be deleted unlearn it's all wasted it was yeah it wasn't unlearning but there was it was pointless hmm. so you had to go through that journey and understand okay start the basics again right in many cases just start with english start with simple math start with simple processing and understanding of a product two a lot of it was cultural huh. and around work habits as much as it was about subject matter expertise so it's just explaining look go through hmm. this is the discipline that we expect you to do we even started a course remember teaching people of 
Okay, here's what it looks like when you come to work, guys. <laughs> right? Because people didn't know. And people thought, Agai, Agle din, boss, sorry, throw a little way. Sorry, uh, uh, no, late hmm. Aye, please. Uh, we can't afford this. A lot of it was cultural um, around their heads, thinking about excel, hmm. thinking about the self discipline of work, thinking about the desire for excel. A lot of it was around habits of asking people to think deeply about how they work, um, what do they like about work, what do they not like about work, creating excitement around work. Hmm. That's something that we did very well. We created a lot of excitement around the kind of work. We, again, being pioneers, it helped, right? So being tell, be able to tell people, look, this is path breaking, this is new. And also people were reading. every. We were in the papers every day. We were in the papers every day for something or the other, some new hmm. industry, and people were proud to be there. So building that pride also became important. So along with content, you really have to do all the other things that you would expect, which ideally a school or college education should have done also, mm -hmm. given you an idea about your work, about your career, about professions, etc. But frankly, it doesn't do that. It does nothing of that. How was your relationship with your bosses? And, you know, you mentioned that uh, Jack was unlike he was saying that this idea won't work and then you proved him wrong. How did it develop? Tell us some interesting stories that you had with your bosses. <laughs> no, I, no I, 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 look, I, I was very rebellious. Okay. Um, my bosses were always worried about what I was doing in India, hmm. except for Gary Went, who okay. knew me well. But then Jack fired Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so my godfather disappeared. <laughs> um, but I had some fabulous bosses. Entrepreneurial, risk taking, fantastic. Art Harper, who was one of, who unfortunately died, uh, but probably one of the most, one of the greatest guys I'd met for a long time. We had, so we had great bosses who taught me a lot to think about Six Sigma, think about operating excellence, think about running a big factory. Because all of a sudden, what were we doing? Hmm. We were running a big factory of, with 20,000 employees. I, hmm. I, I, I'm a leverage buyout guy. I don't know anything about running that. We learned how to hire people better. How do you build a streamline? And by the way, many of the basic platforms we built for transitions, hiring, etc., are what is being used in the world, uh, outside world today. Hmm. A lot of it went from XG people who went to other companies. So if you look at around the BPO industry, there's no one there which doesn't have some XG impact people, right? So it basically gave birth to that. I think with our bosses, it was extra. Actually, with GE, it, it, in, at the end, it wasn't that good because they wanted us to become part of shared services, which was the back mm. office center huh. in... And I said, I'm not doing that, guys. I'm just not doing that. But again, you know, thanks to them. We went to them and said, listen, spin us off because otherwise we'll um, lose all our people, including me. Um, and um, they let us spin off. Emelt let us spin off and... That's how we've gone in private equity people. So there was some um, back and forth and tussle out there as to what we were doing. Um, how, how did you win this negotiation? You know, they knew hmm. that if I walked hmm. and I walked out with 10 executives or something like that, this could be very difficult. So that was a gunshot on their head? I didn't ever use it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did let them know that if they put me in shared services, which they did, that I was extremely unhappy and something was going to happen and it was up to them. Uh, but I think, you know, you don't have to do this. They're smart people. Um, and also, I don't think they realized the value that had been created till other people went to them and bankers and private equity firms went to them and said, guys, spin you off and look, we'll give you so much money. I mean, they'd invested 50 million. And, you know, the deal we did was at $800 million of value. So wow. it was like they were sitting there saying, really? <laughs> it, it's worth that much? <laughs> I, but this is a very good segue into leadership aspect and what you teach at Ashoka. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Because uh, I have spoken to a couple of people that you closely work, work with. And they mentioned, and I quote verbatim, they say, you're a born leader. And, you know, you lead by example. According to you, what is leadership? Yeah. 
I don't think there's one definition of leadership ever. And there shouldn't be. Leadership encompasses many different things. To me, it's the Peter Drucker, famous management guru. He had the best definition of leadership. He said, leadership is a, a leader is anyone who has followers, <laughs> right? If you don't have followers, you're not a leader. So he boiled it down to, you can be charismatic, you can be quiet, you can be a risk taker, you can be bad, you can be good, you can be all of that. To me, my definition of leadership is the ability to build the best organization. Because a great organization can do anything. And to me, that was the essence of, the essence of leadership was build a great organization, mm -hmm. build a great culture where people work together, work in teams, uh, not in teams sort of like donkeys, but in teams which have a robust cut and thrust, mm -hmm. where you have the smartest people rubbing shoulders with each other, but doing it in a, I wouldn't even say frictionless way because I like friction. I think it's good in the organization to have free. But do it in a very constructive, positive manner to take it forward. How do you do that? By example, I think. By example. Give by it. setting the example, by talking to people. Well, we had certain rules in the organization which I used to dwell on significantly. Um, For example? Um, don't bring ever bring me a political problem. I will never attempt to solve it. But in an organization, there will be political problems. And my point was... If that gets in the way of work, both of you will be in trouble, and I'm not here to solve it. And if you can't solve it, then tell me, are you a grown adult or are you a bachar? And I would go down that path of saying, don't bring me turf issues. If you can't manage your own turf issues, hmm. don't look to leadership to help you. And these are the senior most leaders. Hey. You do it through empowerment, you allow them huge flexibility, but you hold their feet to the fire. You hold it with terrific sense of numbers and budgets hitting that. But beyond that, you say, go and do whatever you want. So the way I had been sent to India, I was sent here with nothing. I was sent here with a suitcase and briefcase in my hand by uh, for G Capital and said, go and see what you want to do. And, you know, three months later, I came up with a blueprint of this is what I want to do. And they said, yes. Right. And the same thing I was trying here, which is, guys, you've got the automotive sector, hmm. Harpreet, go hmm. and find your way through it, go and find which company to talk. I'm not going to help you that. I'll give you great power. I'll support you all the way. So you have to do a lot of it by example and by thinking through the organizational and emotional dynamics. Your EQ has to be very high. Your EQ has to be very high. I, I'm not the most empathetic person in the world, or everybody will tell you that, but my EQ of understanding what's happening amongst teams, et cetera, is very good. And so you must know that really well to understand mm -hmm. the guts of your organization. How is it working every day when you're going? You should be able to feel the pulse. How do you feel the pulse? How do you, you know, increase the EQ level so that you understand what's happening between two folks? You really start studying how things are working. You pay attention to interactions between teams. Hmm. I would always do this. Um, I would always have our operating reviews, which were very famous, with 40 people in the room. Why were these famous? Five, because they were very tough. Okay. <laughs> if you talk to anybody who worked for me, they will tell you operating reviews. Holy shit. <laughs> so when you have 40 people, what, what were the dynamics? The dynamics are uh, very, uh, um, very much the opposite of what we expect in India. The dynamics are very much, it's open. It's, you've done some, if you haven't performed, I'm not going to hide and say this to you quietly, say you didn't do well. Upfront. Hmm. Good and bad. What happened to your performance? Why didn't you perform? What is the matter? And there's 40 people listening. What did you do? You did perform, fantastic. How did it happen? Tell the others. Hmm. So openness, transparency, complete transparency, no politics. We had, we did have politics in the company, but no politics overall. No politics. We're all here to work together. Uh, very transparent. Be very fair with your employees. They must know that you have their back. So I was a hmm. very tough boss, but I had their back. They knew that. They could rely on me at a time if they needed help, if they needed support, 
Bam, I was there. I was all good. So give them that strength that they want. So you build the entire culture like that. You work together. So very often if we had a net income problem, you need to meet your numbers. Uh, you have a gap in the numbers because something hasn't happened. You, I would often go to the room and say, this is a problem, guys. Hmm. And I'm going to leave you here for a couple of hours, the entire leadership team. And the leadership was never 10 people. It was 40. And I'm going to leave you here, guys. And I'll come back in two hours. And I hope we have an answer. Hmm. And they always have an answer. They'd always solve for it. They said, this is what we're going to do. Da, 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 da. So you empower people. One of the failures that we have in many organizations, we don't empower them. We don't, we micromanage them. We want to check what they're doing. So I'm just giving you anecdotes. There's a framework for this. So we built a cultural framework that we wanted <clears throat> out there. It starts from what are the kind of people you hire. Hmm. You hire for energy, you hire for curiosity, you hire for um, intelligence, you hire for... Um, smarts, you hire for ambition, you hire for hunger. You don't hire just for content. Hmm. You hire people who, you hire for people who are marathon runners, you know, hmm. 30 years, five days a week, six days a week, 10 hours a day, go. Wow. That's what you do. So you hire that capable, you bring them together, and by example, you show them constantly by example how what are the values you want and what are the values you don't want. And that becomes a very path-breaking way of building a fantastic culture. And I must say, and I, I'm very proud, the culture in Genpact is extraordinary. Is this framework out there in public? <clears throat> no, no. It's within Genpact itself. It's changed hmm. over there, over time. Um, it's a set of values which are based on a set of cultures, set of way, and the way we hire, and the way we behave, and the way we evaluate people. So it goes up and down the ranks. And, it, and you have to build that. But it's also intuitive, you see. So it's not just laying it out. It's also intuitive when I'm talking to somebody, hmm. understanding how they're feeling, understanding what they're thinking, understanding is it going well, why are they worried, what's worrying them, and solving for the problem. Tell us two stories. One where your leadership, your boss at GE and other places did something which, you know, you felt like this is an epitome of leadership and also an example where in your organization, your juniors did something by example, which gave you a very good lesson, a lesson yeah. about this. There were, um, there were hundreds of such examples, I would, I would tell you. Um, certainly at the leadership level, hmm. Um, it was fantastic because that's how we learned how with Welch and others that one was giving extraordinary um, hmm. positions to young people, right? So extra, just watching them saying, boom, boom, do this. D -d take someone from here and say, you're it. Breaking boundaries. So not worrying about hierarchy, not saying, Oh, I wonder what that person will think. I wonder what that person will think. Well, what about these other leaders? They'll get upset. We're not here to make people happy. <laughs> we want them to be happy. But our work is not going to be guided by who gets hurt and who doesn't get hurt. It's, it's off the table, that discussion. Certainly in my case, it was in the company. And <laughs> I don't think many, there were many people who didn't like it. But for me, it, these discussions are off the table. Um, to say, no, no, this is the age, this is the group, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I, I find people doing this nonsense all the time. Whereas I would take somebody young hmm. and say, you're in charge, go. Promote you three levels up, go. It changes the psyche of the organization. It tells people who are in position that one, anybody can come in. Two, that if you're good, you're, you're, you're uh, allowed to be there. Three, longevity, by the way, of Genpak people, people is extraordinary. They've all been there 30 years. Wow. Piyush Mehta, our HR head, 30 years. Uh, yesterday I met a chap called Deepak Majid, 26 years. He's just left. Uh, they, they've all been there. Tiger's been there 35 years. Uh, all of them. And because of this empowerment and this feeling that I'm always being treated fairly. Wow. So I think I, I'm talking about it again anecdotally, just as uh, examples, but there were many such examples that you would do. Certainly sitting together hmm. culturally, one of the things I loved was the ability to look at reality uh, really well. 
Um, Can you give an example? Yeah, it was, you know, if a business is not doing well mm -hmm. or something hadn't gone well, there were no excuses made. There was no, you know, it happened because of this and it happened because of the market and it happened in Navratri Aga and then, you know, G20 happened and the market was closed. We were supposed to do X amount of volume. We did Y person. We missed it. Sorry, guys. We'll make it up next. That's it. So that ability to be very objective about your own reality and not run from the truth or to try and disguise it is very important. And I learned that really well with these people because you could not take that discussion because it would be, you know, it would almost be laughed at of saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. The sun rose and therefore you missed the number. <laughs> Great. So you take those things off the table. Three would be about people. You hired excellent people. You went out, you searched, you trained, and you spent a lot of time on people. You spent 50% of your time on people. And that's something that I learned, that you spent a lot of time on your people. When you say you're spending time with people, what do you mean by spending time with people? What do you do? Coaching them, talking to them. See, every interaction with a, a lot of people who tell me, you haven't done a full huh. employee assessment on me, performance review on me every year. And I would say, I'm doing it every day. You know, what do you want me to say? I mean, do you not know where you stand with me? Is there any doubt? <laughs> right? And then helping them. Think through it. No, think they through this way, think about new hmm. ideas, think about new things, think about a new way of to think, talking about how you promote, how you build the organization, showing it through examples all the time, all the time, all the time. You have to be incredibly consistent yourself, being very fair. In youngst and in younger people, we saw extraordinary elements of leadership, extraordinary. I mean, you know, sending Anju Talwar um, to set up Dalian in China, never been there, minus 17, no Chinese, no Japanese, etc. Go set it up. Um, Piyush Mehta, our HR head, he became HR head because there was some events that happened in Jaipur, actually. Hmm. And uh, um, I was adamant that we had to fire somebody okay. because it hadn't gone off well and they'd done the wrong thing. And blah, blah, blah. I was very adamant. And he went out there. He said, let me go. He, went, he was a young HR guy. He wasn't the head of HR at that time. And he came back and said, no problem. You're wrong. And I, nobody really fought me very much, you know, because I was pretty tough. Uh, <laughs> and he stood his ground. He said, absolutely not. He said, that is absolutely the wrong thing for Gen Factory. And I was convinced it was the right thing to do. And so then I, I said, all right, if you've got that much conviction, I asked three other people, they confirmed it. And I said, you know, a, a man with that much courage of conviction, take him forward. Uh, so there were many, many, many examples, you know, sending Harpreet Dugal out to Latin America and saying, open doors. These people were going, they were extraordinary. They would just pick up a bag and go off to a new continent and start getting business. What were the qualities of these people? When you're talking about these people, mm -hmm. if you have to tell, okay, th this is the underlying cause, this is the quality of these folks that is helping them to achieve what they are uh, achieving when they are, you know, taken from anywhere yes. down and, you know, yeah. from... Entrepreneur. Very much. Risk takers, very much. Uh, people who by then knew how to build organizations and art, who'd learned that through the process. Certainly hunger. Hmm. You know, for me, energy is important. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people laugh at that a little bit because they think energy may kya hai. If you don't have energy, you don't survive. You survive 10 years. You know, you want to do something in your life. 40 years, go for it. <laughs> and I tell the students that and all of them sitting there saying, holy shit, man. <laughs> I don't want to deal with it. So tell us why building this phenomenal company and multiple organizations, what were the toughest decisions that you made during your journey, sir? And what did you learn from those? Maybe a story or two on that. Yeah. We made many mistakes, many mistakes. Um, Skills Academy, Lost it completely. Didn't what was what the we mis mistake? We under we had no idea about the local market. We didn't realize that there's a world out there which we just don't understand, which is the villages of India. We have no idea. Hmm. We waddled in there assuming this would happen, that would happen. That was a complete mistake. Um, I think we started new businesses which were a complete mistake uh, in many cases. 
And we've certainly had um, mistakes that we've made uh, in the leverage buyout days. I was a CFO and, you know, the world turned turtle on us overnight. Whoa, hmm. the junk buy. And my God, we went from making a profit of $150 million to a loss of $150 million. It was just, bam, completely, huh. right? The world had collapsed around us uh, at that point in time. So there were many of these. The toughest things are still always hmm. around people, moving people on, firing them, hiring someone, promoting someone, delivering bad news to others. But the lesson I've learned from that, I, I keep telling people, I've never ever not fired, I've never ever fired early enough. What do you mean by that? We always delay bad news. And it hurts the organization for a year before you take action. Happens all the time. We all do it. We think give them one more chance. We don't realize that that person is unhappy. The organization is unhappy. It's... He or she is making the rest of the people unhappy. Hmm. Holding up the work because by not doing their own work properly. And therefore you should move fast. And most people think it's a cruel thing to do. Hmm. Whereas the answer is actually it's the right thing to do for them and for the company. And they'll be happy. They'll stop the struggle. I think there were many other things, you know, spinning off 9-11 hit us in the middle of the Gen Pact rise. I thought our industry had ended. I thought business is over. Uh, because who thought after that outsourcing would happen, et cetera, you know, because the world had gone to war. And they stopped traveling in planes. Uh, everything. Everything had <laughs> stopped, right? So I, I remember the head of HR for GE was here. and um, He was sitting at the airport in mm. Delhi when the, this news broke. He was on his way home and they sh shut down uh, all flights in and out of America. Right? American guy. And I remember tracking him down at the, at the lounge and saying, Mark, do you, I just want you to know. So you need to find your way to... Tokyo or anywhere else you want or come back hmm. because you're not going to get into America. Uh, and that we thought would stop our business. The financial markets collapsed. 40% of our business was financial services at GenPAC. And the financial markets collapsed in 2008. Extraordinary. Our stock price, we went public at $14 a share. Financial markets collapsed. Our stock price was $7 a share. Hmm. So lots of things, lots of tough times. But, you know, I think at the end of it, you have to recognize these are all, what it teaches you is no crisis is as bad as it seems and no good times are as good as they seem. And it's all par for the course and you have to run with it. So you're in board of a lot of companies. And I used have, to be, I'm much less now. But you have a nerve check on the think tanks and all, you know, a lot of data. How do you think, how is, how is our future going to be like? What are some opportunities? What are you bullish on? I'm very bullish on India economically. Mm. Uh, I think India will do really well. Its demographic dividend will be good. I think we'll grow well. Mm. I think all of that will happen. But I'm not sure that it will happen at the scale and speed which we need it to happen to lift the country out of poverty. And I worry immensely about education and skills development in India, which no government seems to be tackling. And I don't understand why. It is the heart and soul of the fabric of a country. And yet we aren't doing enough about it. So that worries me a lot. Hmm. Politically, I worry about our country a lot. You know, where is it heading? How will it change? Our politics doesn't have the leadership that we would love to see, that all of us love to see. You know, it has a few, hmm. but not enough. Not enough people of wisdom, strength, leadership, depth, etc. Um, but economically, I think we'll do well. But I think that unless we take the friction out of the system. Our bureaucracy hmm. is intense in India. It is heartbreaking. 
And by the way, they're in power. They're not going to give up. So it's going to take leadership at the political level to change that. But our bureaucracy wants to control everything. I mean, the RBI wants to tell you how much to charge, how many messages you get on your SMS, <laughs> what to do. I mean, why? Let the market prevail. Which country has, you know, not let this happen? And it can be a... Most, most developed countries. You never have to face this stuff. You never have to see it. It just works. I can open a company in Delaware in half an hour, sitting right here. You know, I go to Estonia a lot. Go and see how it works there. It's just smooth as silk. But here for... Hmm. It's also... The problem is it's, all, it's the bureaucrats love for micromanagement and tweaking. So they'll tweak it and say, in tariff imports, you can bring in this, but you can't bring in this. <laughs> Just make it easy, the forms that you have to fill. I mean, if I'm trying to sell assets in a company, I'm filling in forms like that, just for a sale. So if you want to open a bank account, try doing something with a bank nowadays. Um, this has to stop, uh, and someone has to take great ownership of getting this done. I, wa I was really hopeful that our current prime minister had started doing that, but it's not happening at the ground level. Our bureaucracy is increasing. It's not going down. And how we can solve for that? You have to, honestly, it'll take political leadership and guts because the bureaucrats aren't going to do it, right? Because this is their power base. So it has to take that. Or it has to take bureaucratic leadership hmm. and who actually start driving change here. Um, but without that, we'll be fighting this bogey for a very long time and it won't let us operate. I mean, every day, I'm just trying to think, there's some new rules which have just been announced. You know, like they announced GST on credit cards overseas, right? <laughs> good, good God. Can you think of anything more uh, weird? Um, Look at the forms that will require, look at the filling. I mean, I spend, I've run a New York Stock Exchange income. I used to spend 3% of my time on the regulatory compliance, compliance mm -hmm. there. I spend 20% on small entities here. We're always talking about, at a career, we're always talking about FCRA rules or reporting rules. At clicks, we're always talking about RBI regulations, somewhere else, Asha Impact, Gift City. My God, to put money into there, I signed forms this thick. It took us five months to transfer 25 grand. You know, can't, you can't run a modern developed uh, country this way. What would be your last set of advice to the college students who want to learn organization building and how should they go about personal development? So organization building is hard hmm. because it's actually not practiced very well by most organizations. Hmm. And it's very practical rather than theoretical. But certainly reading about that is a critical element that they must do. Hmm. I also think you've got to think about your own leadership style. You've got to think about what you're really good at yourself. Hmm. What are you good at? Are you good at, um, are you good at uh, an analysis? Are you good at empathy? Are you good at people? Are you good at... Hmm. thinking through business problems, are you good at designing new products? You've got to think about what you're really good at and then build, use that as the platform to build other skills. Learn very quickly how to manage people. It's the heart and soul of anything you do. It's the thing we don't pay enough attention to. Most people end up learning it on the fly. Hmm. And yet, at middle to senior management level, it is 50% of your job. So one, I always tell be learn how to manage people because that's extra. It's painful. It's harder than manufacturing a product. You want me to manufacture a product, I'll do it. You try managing 20 people with all different ideas and different things to do, it doesn't happen, right? It's uh, my ex-HR head at Genpack was very good. He used, to, he used to describe our management team. He said, you know, he's an American guy, lovely, <laughs> wonderful guy, Al Kennel. And he would say, Bravo. I said, what? He said, your management team, I told him, I said, your management team, sir, reminds me of my, my granddaughter's football team. <laughs> so I said, what do you mean, why? He said, wherever the ball is, the entire team is there. <laughs> 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 right? Everybody on there, it's not segregated in any way. It's not organizationally thought through. I think learn things like that. Learn 
as to why an organization works as a, why one organization doing the same thing as another, one is five times more productive than the other. Think about that deeply. When you travel overseas, think deeply about why do those cities work the way they do? What does it take? Right? What does it take? Simple, answer simple things for yourselves. What does it take to get traffic to work hmm. very well versus us? What is it? What's going on in our mind? I went to Kenya just now. I've just come back. No honking, no cars, nothing. Lots of traffic jams, lots of traffic, no honking. Nobody. Everybody just waiting patiently. What is it in the psyche? What is it in the culture? It's not just, look, nobody honks. There's a deeper answer. Look for those deeper answers every time. What's your recent movie or a series that you have watched, <laughs> which, which you enjoyed the most? So I don't watch any TV. Okay. I, I don't watch series. I have never watched, I haven't watched a series in 20 years. Um, I watch movies occasionally. Oppenheimer was fabulous. I watched that. But, you know, and, and uh, there are other movies I've seen. Oppenheimer was fantastic. Any book that has changed your life? Yes. Poor Economics by Abhijit Banerjee. Fantastic book. Read that. Uh, I suggest everybody should read it. I've also done a quorum session with him seven months yes. ago. Yes. I know. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Most favorite travel destination? Most favorite travel destination? Um, probably, you know, for vacation, easily safari, Africa. So. Zimbabwe, Botswana, Nairobi. Been, I've been to the ball. Extraordinary. Best advice that you have got? Best advice, best advice that I've got is, you know, keep your life simple, um, as simple as possible. Business is simple. It's not complicated. Don't complicate it. Don't make it sound bigger than this. Just think about it in very simple terms. And that's when you'll get to the heart of your own business. How did you meet the most important person in your life apart from your kids? <laughs> I don't think there's one such person. You know, my father was very important. So I think it's more family. Uh, I had, I've had the joy of fabulous friends. Um, you know, one of the people I think I, that I, I, I already owe a lot to is a gentleman called Rajat Gupta, who is one of my closest friends. McKinsey. Yep. He's one of my best friends. I've read his book, End yeah. to End, Mind Without Fear, yeah, recently. Yeah, yeah. Amazing book. <laughs> and he's, you know, and so I've had fabulous friends. I've had friends in literature, art, everywhere else. It's, it's, and what's next on your bucket list, sir? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough already. So we'll, um, I think, I think next would be, can we play a role in solving for gender harassment? Hmm. Can we play a role in helping education skills happen in India? And can we play a role in helping build, which is something I love, I do a lot of venture capital. Can we play a role in building a new set of companies which are extraordinary in terms of healthcare? Wow. Uh, those would be things I would love to do. Thanks, sir, Tan. Super grateful. <laughs> You've been very kind. Thank you.